Right on. In this video, we're going to talk about the aspects of Bangkok 7, part 1. So the reason we're breaking this into parts is because there's so much stuff that I want to talk about with Bangkok 7, because it's such a paradigm shift in the way that we do a lot of our swordsmanship. So these aren't going to be like in the previous you know, two-parter, where it's kind of like one thing and then two things in the next video. This is going to be pretty crammed. Right, so there's so many new ideas, so many new techniques that I want to talk about. Um, a lot of them kind of like one, like quick one-offs. So I just want to have right, at least two videos uh, with sets of three that we can talk about. So let's get started with this one. One quick note that I would like to have as well is that all of these things, uh, and that's why I mentioned otherwise, are my own understandings of the form. So just for, for your context, dear listener, um, I recently relearned this form from you know, someone who you know, learned it more recently than I did. Um, so I updated my form. So this is me interpreting uh, the new style of the form that I'm getting used to. So again, unless I said otherwise, like all of this is kind of like my own weird interpretation on uh, the form that I just learned. So keep that in mind. Part one is going to have a lot more of the conceptual stuff that I want you to think about. Uh, and part two is going to be a lot more about the application of some of the weirder looking techniques. So once again, let's get started. So the first one I'd like to talk about is why we do so many center cuts when we're finishing a combination in a direction. So for example, even in the very beginning of the form, and you'll notice this happens quite a lot in this form. So even at the beginning, right, so if we're here, we do our nice spin cross cut, and then we come in, center cut. And then we go into our next combination, right? Uh, just to kind of show you in the front, right? So the idea is we're here, turn, bang, and then center. And then again, we turn and do our next combination. So that seems very, very strange, right? Because why do a center cut when we allegedly are finished going off in that direction, right? So we just did our spin. So first of all, again, reminder that the spin is to check both behind you and in front of you as you go, right? So normally, like in most of our forms, we're here, and then we go into a defense, right? Just because like, all right, like, just kind of surveying the land, kind of seeing what's up, and then I turn, maybe deal with my you know, opponents behind me that I may not have seen as well. Uh, although we do know we're, they're there because of that spin we did in the beginning, right? So again, so why? So I just did this, I check behind me, clear, and then cut, and then go in the opposite direction. So if that was a cut, so let's talk about a few things. So one is I just dispatch someone there, right? And that sort of <laughs> might make some sense. Although if I did dispatch, it's very unlikely I would want to turn my back immediately to someone like that. Uh, additionally, think about this. So if that was in fact a dispatch and that went into the other person's cranium, most likely it would then finish all the way down here. So then it'd be very weird for us to use the false edge to sweep to come back because it will be either embedded in the brain, even if it cut all the way through, that's going to mean like just so like a leg here, something like that. It'd be very weird to do a big sweep in that direction. So like, okay, so if we didn't dispatch someone, which is the usual way or the usual reason we have center cuts, right? Well, what was the other reason that we had for center cuts? So think about Sangsu 7. Well, Sangsu 7 was like, I see this one dude coming towards me, I'm going to clear and then get back and then take care of my foe. Okay, <laughs> if that's true, uh, so again, probably not actually dispatching, probably not necessarily clearing, because same reason, I'm turning my back immediately. Uh, and it's not really for a short amount of time, I'm really going all out. Now that said, with this spin, you can still check behind you, but the idea is like, all right, if that was a clear towards one person, that person can really you know, rush me as I'm doing my spin cuts this way. So a clear doesn't, <laughs> clear is not a clear indication of what we're doing here either. So those are the two major ideas that we've already played with, right? So again, dispatch or clear. So this has to be either something new or one of those two, right? <laughs> because if this is the only two ways we can do it. So this is what I'm gonna to put to you. So because this form is all about, again, a lot of raw power, a lot of spins, a lot of, again, just raw pushing through, I'm going to need a nice, sufficient way to really stop my momentum without, again, pulling me forward like this and be able to turn on a dime. What's going to do that? 
subguns, right? So this is one reason, so to kind of put us in another perspective, this is one reason that Yaido, uh, so that's the Japanese Yaido, not, you know, Yedo, <laughs> right? Uh, so Yaido does full cuts, and Kendo does, I don't call them half cuts, but you kind of get the idea, we're cutting forward this way. So if you think about those two, this will kind of like put things more into perspective. So if we do a kendo cut here, you kind of feel your, moment, your momentum keeping going. That was a terrible sentence, but you get the idea. So the idea there was like, all right, I'm expecting my opponent to absorb that forward momentum, or if it's not sufficient, I can collapse towards them and then do some other technique close range. Okay, so if I stop here, I keep going. In uh, Yaido, I'm going to switch those up. In Yaido and uh, our swords, uh, in, in Gundo, a full cut is usually used to help stop your momentum, right? So all we're going to do, right? So we just we're here, right? We do a nice fun spin. We're here. <sighs> You're stopped, right? So then from here, I can really push my momentum in a new direction. So this is very different from, for example, Banco Two, which is all about that rolling power. Bangkok 7, which makes it so weird and interesting, is going to be all about that roiling power, but then being able to stop and go the opposite direction. Right, so you're going full on this way, and on a dime, coming back the other direction. So that makes this really cool. So that's one explanation of why we do center cuts in this form, as opposed to merely going into a defense, and then going into our next combination. The second concept that I would like to play with is the difference between using our left Pao Sung Se and our right Pao Sung Se. So in this form, this is doing something very, very specific. Now again, this is a pet theory that's probably not going to be true, which is an interesting way to conceptualize this. So in this form at least, um, my pet theory is the left Pao Sung Se, which also looks like um, the left pushing block. So if you remember from Bangkok also too, right, so we had this cut, this pushing motion and our slitting motion. So it's going to be the same thing there, just on our left side. So in general, I kind of like keep my Pao Sung Se and those very similar. So that might be one weird thing. But my pet theory is uh, Pao Sung Se on the left side is when you're going into a defensive position versus on the right side is when you're going to be doing an offensive position. Now there's going to be a would-be counterexample but you're going to see that's also going to be true, at least in this case. So let's take a few ideas from the form, right? So let's even take a look at the very first move, right? Or technically second one, if you want to think of it that way, uh, where we're here, right? So this is our typical guard that we have in all of the bottom cook. To, <laughs> to some point, right? So five is a little bit weird, but uh, at some point, all the bottom cook come to this guard as their ready guard. So from here, this is me just kind of surveying the land and eventually going into a clear shot in order just to kind of see what's going on. And again, then we do our center cut uh, in the beginning. So this is, again, defensive, right? So the idea is I'm here. If someone jumps out at me, I can come into the defense, defense, you know, defense. Some way I can, again, defend myself. But this is a nice way for me just to survey and then going into, again, a not quite defensive, but still not quite offensive yet either clear, kind of like checking your surroundings, and then that center cut stop the momentum. Okay, so that's one, nice, <laughs> that's one nice position. Let's take a look at a right position, which is coming up next, right, where we're here, and then we go into the pop, pop, right? So that happens quite a few times, right? So from here, we almost always go into a strike of some sort, right? So in this form, that's usually going to be cut, spin, diagonal, that might be from here going into an uppercut, right? Um, or something kind of similar. Now this is something that might sound like a defensive thing that we're gonna show that's actually more offensive. Uh, is gonna be nearing the end where you block, right? Which seems like a defensive thing, right? Block, thrust, right? But what's actually going on is this is a very offensive block, right? So someone's coming in here. I am offensively coming in with that you know, Pao Sung Se, and then aiming for that thrust. So again, <laughs> the, the best defense is in fact a, you know, secret offense, right? So someone's coming in, I'm not just being like, no, I have stopped you. The idea is that they're coming in, I am blocking, but blocking in such a way that I can still get in a nice strike if I need to. 
So again, if you kind of go through the rest of the form, you're going to notice in general, if you're on your left side, it's going to be a defense, right? So for example, we have a lot of coming from here, and the block, and then kenjok, right? So this is usually used to defend, which makes sense because uh, this is a very strong position versus this is not going to be as much. So if you cross on the side, not so much. But here is going to be a very nice uh, blocking position. And probably the move that makes this form, like the form's signature, is that weird flourish. So we have flourishes, again, going both clockwise and counterclockwise a lot. Uh, so that's something that's really, really different in this form that we don't do as much in other forms. Now, a close listener might think, well, that sounds an awful lot like something that we do in Yeddo 9, right? So for example, we're here and we flourish stab, or we flourish stab. It almost sounds like we're going to do the exact same thing when we're doing flourish stab, or flourish you know, stab, or something like that. So we're going to do flourishes quite a lot in this form. I think it's like four or five times, something like that. Um, I think it's four. Right, because I think it alternates, right? So why, right? So why are we doing so many flourishes in this form um, as opposed to like all the other previous bong cooks? Now, part of that is going to be the fluidity changes pretty dynamically uh, from you know, one through six and then into seven. So seven is its own <laughs> weird beast, has these really weird techniques uh, that I don't want to obviously play with. So why, why do these flourishes, right? So if we're here, so the very first one, right, is flourish into a thrust, right? So like, okay, that might be, so again, like using our prior knowledge, okay, so we did something sort of similar in Sang Tzu 5, right? So we're, we're, you know, thrust, parry, thrust. So maybe we're parrying. Kind of unlikely, right? So if we're here, so in the form, we're kind of like at distance, if I'm already parrying, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we're, we're not actually in contact yet. So it'd be kind of weird for me to parry your, <laughs> your distant sword into a thrust. Okay, so that doesn't make any sense. So what about the other version of five that I may have talked about? I keep on forgetting if I actually mentioned things on video or not. Uh, so the other version was you're here and you're going around someone's guard to do another couple thrusts. Okay. Again, you might think, well, that's weird because, we're, again, we're not engaged yet, so we're not quite in enough space for me to come in for that thrust. But think about, again, what we did with our flourishes in Yeddo 9. There's a lot of uh, backtracking as well. But think about what we did with our flourishes in 9. The idea with that was, like, you don't know where the blade is coming. You don't know if it's coming underneath, overhead, either side. You'll know where it's coming from. This is going to be very similar, uh, and also something you kind of see in Genbeck as well. But the idea here is kind of like you don't know where the blade is until it's already coming towards you, right? And notice again the angle of the blade. The angle of the blade, if again you were looking from uh, as my opponent, here, especially if I'm here, you're gonna, all you're gonna see is again, um, I just kind of give you an idea, hopefully this works, is if I kind of aim towards the camera, you see actually very little of the actual blade. It's kind of hard to gauge how close it is to your imminent death, right? So for here, and I'm parrying and kind of like trying to watch where it is, most likely all you see is my guard after a while, and then you see it probably all too late going into your diaphragm. Or you're here, again, around in your face, you probably can see uh, most of the length here um, until it's again coming up towards your face that way. So those flourishes are gonna be like, again, hiding your movement uh, before you can strike. Now, would I recommend doing this, uh, especially if you're a lower rank or someone who's new to using this in fighting? No, <laughs> right? So the idea with this is, so there's a, there's a very big trade-off here. So yes, you don't know where my blade is coming, but again, a seasoned person might know where, again, it has to be coming from this general direction, so I can still kind of evade off to the side. Again, here, again, if I evade this way, I can maybe still get you, but it's gonna be very weak. So, yes, like if I can, if I'm up against a low rank and you kind of like flourish, you may not know where it's coming until it's too late, but they at least will not be able to do a very complicated defense. Um, so another reason this is going to be dangerous for newbies is that 
it, as you're flourishing, you're very weak. Right? So if I'm here and they just strike me, I am going to go down. Right? So the blade is going to go way out of the way. I'm going to be open, imminent death coming, etc., etc. So this is why it's Bangkok 7. This is the very last form that you do as a third degree. And remember our idea about third degree. Third degree is a time when you really experiment with extremes, with the weird stuff. And when you hit fourth degree, that's when you really settle on a style and really try to hone that idea. So this is kind of like the end of your college years, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so you're really trying these really new, really kind of like freaky kind of techniques for you to try with. So there's, what, there's that one idea, right? So the idea is you don't know where it's coming from. Additionally, uh, so later in the form, right, so when we actually are engaged here, right, and we kind of do the spin as we're close range, that could be simply, again, going around the person's sword for me to thrust them in the face. Uh, so one quick note, uh, just because I was called on this as well, but, and you should be as well, uh, you might notice as I do this, I kind of do a palming this way. This is 100% not canonical with the Federation. If you want to please the Federation, do not do this. However, if, if you, uh, so for example, Hema does this quite a lot, and also if you're just sparring, uh, you might notice this gives you a little more stability in your thrust because there's more alignment between here and, again, what's reinforcing your palm. This is going to be more powerful than this because this can slide through if you get stuck into a stab versus this is really going to help you drive the blade in to your stab. So one quick caveat, so if you want to please the Federation, don't pommel. Right? or palm, whatever you want to call this, uh, you want to make sure you're still grabbing like so. And there we are. So those are three uh, concepts I'd like for you to play with as you go through Bangkok 7. Again, the reason I'm doing two of these is because, again, I recently relearned this form. It's kind of like in my mind as I'm kind of reviewing it, trying to understand the techniques. I want to share that with you, right? Uh, because the major thing uh, that I want to kind of like share on this channel is like understanding the why and like the, you know, the application of these techniques as opposed to merely going through a form to test and to, you know, get your next shiny belt. So, uh, I would highly recommend, if you can, go through these ideas, really, again, test them whether or not they're true, right? So, like, all right, is left palsam say usually used to, again, on defense? Try that again. Can we retcon it to our other forms? Is that also true for all of Bangkok? Is that also true for all of, again, Sang Su and Yedo? Is our right Pao Sung Se, usually used for offense. Is that also true throughout all of, again, all of Gundo? So really take these ideas and retcon as much as you can. Again, allegedly, if you're watching this, you should be a uh, Sandan, so third degree. So really take these ideas and play with them, take them to extremes, you know, parse them, see if the same idea works with other, other techniques, right? So is there another guard that is predominantly on the left side, more defense? as opposed to offense on the right, is the opposite true for another guard? So that kind of thing. Additionally, think about that center cut stopping your momentum. You, you can notice as you go through Sang Su 1, again, your very first form. If you did, again, this might be, I guess, sort of like a homeworky kind of thing if you want that, uh, but a drill, if you will. Um, so try it two ways, right? So the first way is actually try it with a kendo cut and kind of see the very different aspect. So try cutting here, here, here versus, again, how we actually cut in ours and see how that really changes how you can actually stop on a dime, which I need to find another way of phrasing that, but it's too late. So, uh, so yeah, so play with those ideas. So make sure you, you know, stay safe, stay humble, keep training, and enjoy this form. I don't.